And this last part of the course is going to be about analysis. So after you've understood the concepts and you can uh, interact with the machine at some point, it will generate some data. And ideally, you want to make statements based on that data. And for that, we require rather not necessarily complex, but also not very simple data analysis. So you might ask yourself, OK, I've done microscopy or other uh, research. And generally, at the end, you can just look at the data and try to interpret that and see, well, do I have co-localization? Why should this be any different in, in fMRI? Uh, so the, um, the crux of the matter is generally, if you want to do proper data analysis and make complex statements about complex systems, it doesn't really behoove you to just look at the data in any case. So even if you're used to histology where you just look at a colorful picture, maybe that's good as a quality check. But if you want to do real research and make more intricate statements about what you're observing, it might be better to do more than just look at the colorful pictures to try to do segmentation, to see where the cells are, what the overlap is in a more quantifiable fashion. Other particular features which make fMRI data even less useful suitable to manual visual inspection than microscopy data uh, is the fact that it's simply structured differently for starters. It's 4D, which actually means that it can be represented as points in five-dimensional space. So you can think of it as, as 5D. So it's 4D, but each point has a value yeah, for spatial dimensions, meaning that even if you want it to just look at it, you can't really slice through this plane in order to put it on a display. Because generally, what you can visualize on a display is 2D. You can do 3D plots. yeah. But even with 3D plots, you can only do them if your data has transparency, because otherwise it's just a 3D volume which you can't see through. Uh, so that particularly makes this sort of data difficult to just look at. Why um, five? If we, it, there's three directions and one big. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're talking about fMRI. Sorry if I missed this in the, in the introduction. I thought my, my colleagues already did this with you. Uh, so fMRI stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging. So this is simply MRI. It is magnetic resonance imaging, but which tries to make statements about function. And the way to do this is to have spatial resolution. Uh, temporal resolution, because that's what makes, let's say, function different from structure. Uh, so therefore, you have four-dimensional data, so three spatial dim dimensions, a fourth temporal dimension, and of course, you have the values of the pixels, which you could represent as, uh, as gray intensities. Another problem with just looking at the data, I mean, you could think of, uh, OK, I can't visualize all the data points as, at once, because they're too, too highly dimensional. But I could maybe pick one point in this three-dimensional space and just visualize the time course. Still won't get give you such a nice manual overview because there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of points in this three-dimensional space. It'll take you a while to look at the time course of each one. Uh, in addition to that, you don't need to bother because you probably won't see anything simply because fMRI effects are generally quite low in amplitude. Uh, so. Uh, you're going to need some modeling, to which we're going to get at, uh, at the end, to actually interpret uh, your data. If you just look at the data, it will very commonly look like noise. Yeah, The amplitude is very low, and this is both due to the method, as you might have heard. MRI generally has very low polarization, as opposed to, for instance, fluorescent microscopy, where you get signal from a lot of the particles. In MRI, you might get signal from the water, which is much more ubiquitous than your fluorophore, but only a very, very, very minute fraction of the water is actually polarized to give you signal. And it's also a problem of the feature, simply because the brain is this highly complex and uh, what you're actually looking at in fMRI is blood flow. And the way in which blood flow is upregulated to correspond to neuronal activity is generally quite slight. So it's not like one part of the brain starts consuming, uh, consuming energy while everything else shuts down. It's always a back and forth. So the, the amplitude difference in between an active region and a less active region is generally quite low. Uh, in addition to that, as I've said, the brain is a rather complex system, and you might want to do more complex analysis. So what you can do is you can try to interpret the time courses automatically so that you don't have to do it manually, so that a model tells you how good it fits to your assumption. But even that, just looking at the time courses, so for instance, stimulating every five seconds and seeing, OK, what happens every five seconds in the brain, every 20 seconds, won't actually, might not actually help you in the scientific question which you're trying to address. Uh, because the brain isn't just a, a topological mapping of, of the world or of all possible inputs. Like this thing activates this part, this thing activates that part. You might get that impression from the literature, especially if you read it in the press. But it's not how the brain works. The brain is interconnected. All of your brain is active at the same time. Or here we're talking about mice. All of their brains are active at the same time as well. So you might actually want to look at more subtle things, such as functional connectivity networks, like what parts of the brain correlate with what other parts of the brain, completely independently of your manipulation 
manipulation. Yeah, and this is also something which, of course, you cannot see with the naked eye. Uh, so, in order to be able to ask such questions, you will need some uh, some data analysis, uh, some way to quantify your data in a more automatized fashion than just looking at, at it. Uh, and the broader workflow concept in which all of these steps integrate looks a bit like this. So, this basically takes you from the analog signal to the plot, which we're also going to see in the end. I think my colleagues already took you through the first step, how you get from the analog signal to the FID. FID is free induction decay. It's basically the file which consists of time series which, me which measure the radio frequency signal from your sample. Yeah? It's basically the Fourier transform, the 2D Fourier transform of your data. That's the FID, and that's basically a recording of, os of electromagnetic oscillations on each row. Uh, that's like the very first step, how you get from analog to data at all. And then you go to what, what we call here the Bruker, uh, machine, which is in our case simply the name of the vendor of our hardware and of the proprietary acquisition software. This is a separate computer uh, with proprietary closed source software, which does, uh, we assume, um, reasonable things that we do not know for sure. Uh, and uh, this software is able to digitize the FID. So to transform it from an analog signal into a digital representation of bytes. And then to do the reconstruction to the 2D sec file, this is basically a reconstruction in each plane. Uh, so that basically on the system, we already have one image for each slice of the mouse brain. And of course, you have a lot of metadata, which is important to record because it gives us information about what on earth we did. Uh, moving onward from there in um, on the next system, on which we have this Samurai software, it's called Small Animal Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's a free and open source piece of software developed in our lab. Uh, we basically need to integrate the metadata and, of course, the visual information. And we do so in the nifty format, which I'll describe to you in a second. Once we have integrated that, we basically have raw 3D data, which is encapsulated data and information about the data, which is basically all we need to do our analysis. So basically, all the blue part here, we can completely ignore and start start from here. Uh, starting from there, we need to pre-process the data, meaning we need to take care of some well-known artifacts which might confound or preclude our analysis. Once the data is cleaned, so to say, uh, we would do uh, a statistic, meaning that we will try to summarize this high-dimensional data in a lower-dimensional representation, which is a statistic, which basically gives us information about uncertainty, about the statements we're trying to make. And once we have that, we have plots. Yeah? Ideally, we can share data at each of, these, uh, of each of these points in order to collaborate with people and to have it reviewed. The way this would look like, for instance, the nifty volumetric format, which I've talked to you at the beginning, which is the first format where you summarize all of your data, you put it in a homogeneous 3D representation, and you try to embed the metadata. Uh, we do this via the nifty format, which stands for the Neuroimaging Informatics Technology Initiative, and consists and it consists of two things. It basically stores a data matrix, which is a 3D or 4D or 2D representation of the data. Of course, on the disk, it's just a 1-1D one, one string of bytes. Uh, but it's then segmented so that it fits into the correct shape. And it also contains a minimal header. The header is really, really small and contains only very basic information, including the affine transformation. So if you try to think of a data matrix, it's just a collection of points. Yeah? One, two, three, this could be the values, not necessarily the positions, right? It would look somewhat like the cube on, on the, um, the right-hand side. And here we depict, depict the data as volumes because, of course, the... Um, our data should correspond to volumes because it is sampled from a volume, not from a point. Uh, but what would you say is wrong with this representation on the left-hand side? See, it really says down there incorrectly as volumes. Why would that be incorrect? You can just guess. Mm -hmm. It give the spatial information. Exactly. So the data matrix in and of itself is just a collection of points. We have absolutely no idea to what it corresponds in space. We have absolutely no idea what kind of volume it has. We can make one assumption if we are forced to make one, yeah, if we really want to represent it volumetrically, there is only one assumption we can make, and that is like if I just give you a normal matrix and I say represent this spatially, how would you do that? Points. Well, yeah, if you would have to put it in volumes, because we know that it's volumes. You need the axis, like the mm -hmm. axis, and then we see 
where is it in this, uh, okay. in this so dimension? That, that's what you would need if you had the affine. But you do, if you do not have the affine, then the only assumption which you can make is that each increment, yeah, like each new number, mm -hmm. uh, corresponds to the Einheits vector, to the u unit vector. Yeah, so basically it has a dimension of one isotropically in all directions, and it starts at zero. Uh, this is also how you would end up plotting a nifty file if the affine is missing. So if the affine is set to zero, most programs which interpret nifty files will know that you're not actually trying to say that everything is set to zero and the data doesn't exist, but what, you're prob what probably happened is that the affine got lost. Yeah? However, that is incorrect because simply based just on the data matrix, you could not do something like this because here, these voxels, as you would call them, are anisotropic, meaning that their dimensions are not the same in each direction. And that can definitely be the case when you do fMRI, when you do MRI, simply because you don't need to sample the signal in each direction at the same interval. In order to obtain something like this or any meaningful rep spatial representation of the data, you need the affine. Uh, the affine is a simple matrix. If you have a 3D image, it's a, three, a 3D spatial image. You ha it's a 3 by 4 matrix. And here we show some examples in, uh, like for on, on a 2D space. And basically what this does is it tells you where exactly your spatial features is map are mapped. As you can see on the right hand most image, that's what you would get if you would be forced to make the assumption that simply the dimensions are one along each axis. Yeah, You'd simply get that affine, so that matrix, and the representation would be as you see in the picture uh, on the bottom with the axis, uh, all of the points basically are located at 0, 1, and, or 1 and 0. Uh, you can of course uh, set the origin of your image to be somewhere else than just the corner of the matrix. And you would do that by adding uh, terms for the, the last two numbers, which would basically simply entail a translation. So you just move the origin somewhere else. Yeah, uh, th This makes a lot of sense simply because generally your point of reference, which is zero and relatively to which you want to specify your coordinates, is not somewhere in the corner of the acquisition space where there is actually nothing. We'll look at some brain pictures in a second, but if you imagine, if you take a mouse's brain, it's a bit elongated, or even if you take a human's brain and you try to fit it in a box, like in a rectangle, the corner of the rectangle will be completely meaningless. Ideally, you want some point in the middle or some landmark. That's why generally those last, like the last column in the affine is definitely populated with values because it tells you where the meaningful origin is. Uh, of course, you can do scaling, which is what we've seen in the previous slide, uh, where we had uh, a different scaling in one direction and a different scaling in the other direction for anisotropic voxels. Uh, and something which you generally don't do, though it might happen by accident, uh, is rotation. Yeah? Uh, the issue with rotation is generally you want the slices to be homogeneous through your matrix, yeah. But where you might have problems with rotation, or where you might have an affine with uh, with rotation terms, is if you simply record the data and the animal is tilted, or the human, if you do it in humans, has his brain a bit shifted to the side, yeah tilted rather than shifted. Uh, and then basically the scanner will record the affine relative to zero, which is generally the ISO center of the magnet. So it's generally somewhere really in the middle. It should coincide roughly with the middle of the brain, but it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. So if, you, if the brain then moves in that space, then the initial affine from the scanner will be slightly rotated. Uh, but that's not a problem because uh, you generally transform the image from the scanner space into a more meaningful anatomical space because we generally don't care how the animal was in the scanner. We care how the animal is relative to a standardized space, which we'll also get to in a second. Um, metadata, as you've seen, is simply because the affine is also metadata, but there is much more metadata than just the affine. Uh, the animal number, the session, the manipulations which you've done uh, with the animal, the kind of stimuli which you presented during the experiment, these are all very important. Uh, and metadata should be recorded so that you can meaningfully evaluate your, your um, results. If you've done any research projects, you might have been in the situation where you've uh, done your work, you've done your work, you've been very concentrated, you've written all of your metadata on a piece of paper, then you've lost it, and at the end you have no idea what to do. Uh, which is why it's best to embed the metadata in the same structure as your data files. And this can be done partly in the header, but as I said, the nif nifty header is very reduced in scope. It doesn't give you spaces to put in the, the name of the animal even, like the number of the animal, uh, or the session, or any drug which you might have given during the treatment or something like that. And for that, we have uh, other ways of encoding this information 
information. Uh, there, there's of course databases, but those are complex and, uh, and not very nice and not very portable, so we won't get into that. But a much more friendly, though of course less efficient than a database on a huge scale, uh, but a much more user-friendly way of doing this is BITS, the Brain Imaging Data Structure, which is basically just a fancy set of, uh, of conventions for how to name your files. Uh, well, it's a bit more than that, uh, but it looks somewhere around these lines. So you have a base directory. Inside the base directory, you have subject directories for each subject so that all the data for one subject is stored in one directory. Within that, you have uh, a directory for each session. And within that, you have multiple modality, uh, multiple type directories, which can be func for functional MRI, ANAT for anatomical MRI, and DTI for diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging or diffusion weighted imaging. And within that, you have the name of the file, which again reiterates all of the fields which were in the path so that if you want to take these files and put them in the same location you don't end up overwriting them and in addition to that contains even more information such as the task being presented to the animal or to the human as you see the nomenclature is more uh, inspired by human MRI simply because you don't just generally give animals tasks you give them stimuli uh, ACQ is the acquisition protocol this could be something like EPI for functional imaging or turbo rare for structural imaging uh, run if you do multiple runs with in one, uh, one single session, it is important to know what the order was, simply because uh, the animal, the state of the animal might degrade uh, across time. Uh, and modality, which basically tells you what kind of contrast you have. In this case, for instance, for this example, the modality is bold. So for instance, this is a bold measurement, a blood oxygen level dependent contrast. The first run, so the zeroth run, we are of course computer people, a spin echo EPI. The task is called jog B. This is a convention which we have for one of our stimulation protocols. OFM is the baseline opto fMRI task and the animal is called 4007. Additionally, there are some things which don't fit in the path. Uh, information which you still want to keep track of. You might have heard about a lot of parameters which you play with when you design sequences, such as, such as echo time, repetition time, flip angle, and all of these things you would actually also want to keep track of. But there's no way of putting all of that in the path name, which is why the bit standard also specifies a supplementary sidecar file. It's a JSON file, which basically in JSON representation gives you information on a lot of other keys. So for instance, what the slice timing is, what the flip angle was, and so on. Additionally, if you want to document the event explicitly, not just go with this convention, which we've written here in, in dark blue, you don't know what jog B is, right? You have no idea. So ideally, if I want to share my data with you so that you can work with it, I will have files which document exactly what happened during that task. And these are, for instance, these events files. Given all of this data, you should have all the information which you need for canonical evaluations of, um, of your experiment. So let's look at some actual data. Uh, this is, for instance, what uh, the, the data from one EPI scan looks like. Would you say it looks good? Extremely. Okay, would anybody else say it looks good? Very low resolution. Yes, exactly. So the, the resolution sucks. Anything else which, uh, which is weird about the data? No, really, just the resolution. Okay, well. It's the first yeah. one supposed to be incomplete. Okay, that's very good. And one last thing, which is wrong with the data. Does it look like a brain to you? I can't see behind all the pixels. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't really look like a brain. It's very distorted, especially in the bottom part. And if you look at, uh, for instance, the middle of the slices or the one to the right of it, you will notice it has like some uh, some zebra lines. They're called ringing artifacts. Yeah. So these are three problems which you have correctly identified. The first is not necessarily a problem, or it is rather an unavoidable problem. The resolution is very poor. We record one of these images of the entire brain with a resolution which uh, is actually under a, a millimeter uh, every second. Uh, we don't have the time to generate enough signal for a higher resolution image. Uh, so that's, that's simply um, a, uh, a constraint of functional fMRI. Uh, you will always have very low resolution images. In human brains, it's even much, much worse, uh, simply because you generally get resolutions of uh, over one millimeter. So it's really hard to make statements about like cellular circuitry. The other problem that uh, the first, first slide seems to be missing, and if you've looked carefully, you'll notice that exactly the part which is uh, missing on the bottom of the first slice uh, is, uh, is present on the bottom of the last slice where the top part is missing. Yeah? So the reason why this happens is because of the affine transformation. This animal was not correctly 
and by correctly I mean perfectly evenly positioned during acquisition. Right now we slice at, uh, so to say, in the coronal plane, but the data is not aligned perfectly with the coronal plane. It's slightly tilted forwards, which is why we'll end up getting a few voxels from the first slice before we get the rest, and exactly that amount will be missing on the last slice. That's the second issue. So you can see the affine at work, or rather an incoherence between the data matrix and the affine <laughs> coming, to, coming in full view. The last problem, the artifacts are due to the fact that the animal has an implant in its head. So we basically have an optic fiber which goes into the brain of the animal and which allows us to stimulate neurons with light. Uh, and you can see it on the bottom slices as a hole in the middle of the brain. That's actually where an optic fibers go straight into the brain. Uh, in addition to that, we have dental cement on top of the brain to hold the optic fiber in place, on top of the skull rather, and a scar tissue which forms due to the fact that we, we obviously remove the skin so that we can attach the cement directly to the skull. Uh, and what actually causes the artifacts are these um, uh, areas of scar tissue, simply because the scar tissue is rich in macrophages and iron deposits, like my micro macrophages contain iron, which of course is a problem for our contrast. Yeah? It acts as a defacing agent. Uh, this is what the functional scan looks like. Now let's have a look at the structural scan, because ideally when you scan a mouse, you also acquire information about the structure. This is what the structural scan would look like. But what happens if, like, we, there where we put the optical fiber, what? Yes. Uh, it becomes like a hole. Yes, because there is no signal, because the optical fiber does not contain what? What gives us the signal? Like a... What? No, it's the magnetic field. So the, the, what, what's the yeah. atom that gives us the signal? Uh, oh, hydrogen. Exactly, hydrogen. And the fiber does not contain hydrogen, so there is no signal which we can get from it. But you, you see, you say, okay, I want to put it there, there, because, I mean, it depends where you put it, you lose information there. Mm -hmm. So normally they change the position? No. So it is defined where we want to stimulate. Therefore, we have to put it there. Uh, the fact that we lose signal is an unavoidable evil in the sense that exactly where we're going to stimulate, we're going to risk not getting as good signal as we want to. But we don't just inspect the point where we stimulate. We also inspect the downstream aspects at the entire brain level. We'll see that in a second. Yeah. Uh, but you are correct, signal will be lost here, meaning that the hole which you see in the signal is actually way bigger than the fiber is. Yeah? You'll get a better estimate of how big the fiber is, and it's a lot smaller in the structural scan. Here you can see that you can see the fiber again much more accurately in the, the middle bottom scan, and you can also see that it's much thinner than it looked like in the structural scan, um, in the functional scan. I quite didn't get... Um and the affine, how, how do you get it in the first place? So when the data is recorded, yeah, yeah the, um, the program, so Paravision, the Brooker program, knows, uh, so to say, where the signal is coming from. And it basically encodes that in the spatial representation of the affine. Yeah? Moving onward, although we haven't gotten there, we will transform the image to a standard space and it will have a new affine. Uh, what this first affine tells us is where, it, uh, where the image exactly is located in the scanner. Mm. So if, if I would know where the uh, ISO center of the scanner is, I would be able to tell you where exactly the image is. But why does it split <coughs> these two images here? Like, what is the properties of the, the affine in this sense that it will map one? No, so the, the, the problem is that the data, where we are not going slice by slice by slice through the data matrix. We are going slice by slice by slice through the spatial representation. And if there is any rotation in the data matrix, that means that we will end up imaging, uh, seeing one part of the slice before the rest. So that's why we get this, uh, this effect. Um, the number of slices con contained, as you see here, the name of uh, the resolution of the image is uh, much better. And that's because this is a structural scan. We don't need to acquire it every second. We have time. Uh, this scan, I believe, takes about five, five to ten minutes to, to perform. If, um, if you want to find out more about that and play with the finds, like edit them and see how that changes the visualization of the image, you can do that tomorrow. So these are all fMRI? These are, these are all MRI images, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, the first one was fMRI and this one is? And this is a uh, anatomical image. It's acquired via, via turbo rare sequence. You generally refer to magnetic resonance imaging as MRI. If you're looking at function specifically, you would call it fMRI.
However, when we do fMRI, even though we're mainly interested at the function, in order to be able to map the function to the correct parts of the brain, we also want higher resolution scans. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, so as I said, the resolution here is quite a bit better due to the, the additional time which we have, but the number of slices is still the same. We could have increased the number of slices, but we like to keep it one slice for one slice. As you see, it looks a lot better and there are no distortions, there are no artifacts, and that is because we do not weight the image according to T2 star, we weight it more according to T2, mainly the, meaning that we don't try to take advantage of the artifact, simply because functional, like bold imaging, actually takes advantage of artifacts generated by uh, deoxyhemoglobin. So it is by design sensitive to artifacts because it's the artifacts in quotation marks which give us the signal. Here we are not interested in that, we're simply interested in the T2 contrast. And in the end, we will want to register all of this to a standard space. And a standard space is given by an affine, so a coordinate system, along with a high resolution representation of the brain. So that when we visualize things, we don't have to visualize them on the structural scan, or God forbid, on the functional scan, but we can visualize them on an even higher resolution scan, which gives us very accurate information about the structures which might be involved in the area in which we're looking at. And this is our template, which we use as our standard space. And you can see, A, the resolution in all directions, so not just in the slice direction as it was in our structural scan, uh, but isotropically, as it were, is very good. And it comes with a coordinate system. We can draw in the axis and we have a zero point. In fact, we are centered at zero across the axis. Now, do you notice anything weird or anything which you, might, you would have definitely done differently if you look at this? Yes. So well, if this is the zero, then it seems like the brain isn't properly centered in the second picture, the middle one, basically. The middle one, okay. Yeah. Sure, I'm surprised. I would have expected you say something about the last one, where you don't see, you don't see almost any part of the brain. So yeah, that's definitely right. That comes from the fact that the brain is not centered. Uh, and the reason is that although the center might be a logical, well, logical, an intuitive uh, place to put the origin, it is not necessarily meaningful. Uh, there is nothing, no feature which is particularly meaningful in the geometric center of the brain. Uh, what we want is a feature which is easy to detect and which allows us to interface, to stay in this uh, in the space across modalities. And if you have data, it's fairly easy to stay in one space across modalities because you just uh, register everything to the same thing. That's like we could have put the origin anywhere for that. However, we also want to be able to interface with this when we are operating with like the physical representation of the brain when you like to simply take the, the skin off of the skull and you look at the skull and you start planning an operation on the brain. So ideally you plan it before you start it, but uh, then you start orienting yourself for the specific animal. In order to do that, people generally use a feature which is called bregma. It is the point where the skull plates at the, towards the front of the skull of the mouse, where they converge and they grow together. And if you remove the skin, then you can actually see the skull plates how they grow together and where the point is where they meet. That is very useful and very easy to orient yourself for an operation and that is exactly where we put the center. Which is also why if you look carefully you will notice that the center, although we do see the brain in the last uh, representation, the actual center is in a part which is above the brain and that's because the actual center is just on top of the brain where the skull begins. So the corpus callosum? No, the corpus callosum is uh, part of the brain, which is in the center of the brain, and which uh, connects the hemispheres. Yeah. Uh, what we're talking about is a bone structure, or rather the point on the surface of the brain corresponding to this bone structure. Exactly. So given this, uh, this template and the data which I've shown you, we, will, we would like to make some statements about the function of the functional data, which is the very first thing I've shown you, uh, given the structural representation per animal in this space which we use. So we have to bring quite a few things together. So our, our analysis start, starts quite a bit before we can actually do any modeling or, or any calculations in that sort, in that sense, uh, our analysis starts with the pre-processing. And uh, the question with pre-processing is, is my data ready to answer my questions? It's MR data, as you've seen, it's inhomogeneously sampled. It has a number of quirks 
And first I have to decide, okay, do I need to do anything with this data before I can ask real questions of it? And whether I need to do something depends entirely on the questions. Uh, we have colleagues, uh, we simply try to correlate optical uh, signal from MR signal in one voxel. They don't need a lot of this thing, this stuff, because they just need that one voxel. Basically they can forget about the 3D part, yeah? Or at least they can strongly limited. Uh, but if you're trying to do whole brain analysis, you need to do quite a few things. And this might consist in the timing of your slices. I know in how far my colleagues have informed you, but uh, when you do MR imaging, yeah, you might, functional MR imaging, you might, with an EPI sequence, uh, you might acquire the entire volume of the brain uh, per second. But that doesn't mean that you spend the entire second acquiring from all of the brain. Uh, you've probably heard about um, slice selection, which basically means that the first way to select spatial information so that you can spatially resolve it uh, is by applying a gradient to your magnetic field so that you can just stimulate one slice at a time. Meaning that you always image one slice at a time. Yeah, so say in the axial plane, in, our, uh, in the ax uh, axial direction in our, in our case. Uh, meaning that each slice is acquired at a different time. Meaning that it doesn't really make sense to treat the volume as one per second. Simply because if you get an activity at the same time in the brain, it will be, will be represented differently on each of the slices. Yeah? If you have an activity which just pops up for like one quarter of the second in the entire brain, it might be that some of the first slices which you start acquiring and some of the last ones don't have this activity. So what you need to do in that case is correct the timing and the way you do that is by interpolation. So you try to pick uh, an arbitrary time point to which you register all of the times uh, and some slice will be lucky enough to actually have been acquired at that time point but most will not and the way you get uh, the information for those slices is by interpolating the previous one from the next one. And you can do this linearly uh, with, with splines. You can think of very many ways to do this. Uh, you can try to correct for motion in your data. This is less a problem with animal MRI simply because our animals are restrained and anesthetized. So the extent to which they can move is really, really minimal. Of course, we do work with sub-millimeter resolution, but still, it's not as big a problem as in humans. If you've ever been in an MR experiment, especially functional MRI, uh, you basically lean your head in, in a cushion, which is formed a bit like your head to hold you somewhat stable, uh, but you will move. Like they'll ask you to not move and the fact that they keep annoying you with that should be a sign for how big the problems are, which this can cause at the analysis level. Um, yeah. Very simply speaking, if you have two slices mm -hmm. that, for example, are two milliseconds away from each other in terms of um, acquiring, and they yep. have exactly the same amount um, or the same peak, the same amplitude mm -hmm. signal, yep. so then you would just and if you choose to take the first mm -hmm. slice as a registration, then you would kind of um, lower the signal of the slice that is um, acquired afterwards, or...? Yes, so you, basically if you, so if you have the same signal in two slices, of course, if you do a simple linear interpolation, nothing will happen. Uh, but there are different kinds of interpolation which you can do. You don't just need to consider the, this one, like the previous one, and the next one. Uh, you could do uh, by cubic interpolation, which means that you're actually trying to fit, or a cubic in this case interpolation, where you're actually trying to fit over multiple time courses of function. Or you could do a splines interpolation, which allows you, so to say, to control each level uh, depending on the width which you expect the signal to have. The ratio from the time point before to the time point after will be different per slice, which is why it might make sense to have these more complex features because you will not weight the one before and the one after equally. Mm -hmm. So the question is how, you, how do you decide on the weighting? Do you do it just linearly or do you, do you try to fit an, an order 2 function or an order n or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, if movement in patients is such a large problem, why don't you fix it ahead? Well, it depends. I mean, if uh, if it's a huge problem and if the patient really, really needs a high resolution, then you would definitely be able to fixate the head. The problem is that a lot of fMRI is actually not done in patients. So fMRI, this is, so to say, well, not necessarily a dark secret, but a huge embarrassment of the field. Uh, fMRI doesn't really produce cleaning, uh, clinically meaningful results. It's not really part of the standard of care in anything. People are trying to do that, but pro progress is at best slow. Most fMRI is done by psychologists who try to ask, 
ask questions of participants. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the the extra money which you would want from me if I'm going to strap your head in in a contraption to come for the study uh, might make it prohibitive for me to acquire a high enough sample size. People tend to be very very weird about this. Maybe not us, simply because we're scientists, and I'd also be like, yeah, okay. I mean, I know how a stereotactus works. You basically just fit some things in your ears, and it's uncomfortable, but not very. Uh, but if you take people off the street, like they they're already very quirky about li lying in a magnet for you, much less having stuff shoved into their ears, and so that, that's why you don't do that. It's, it's a comfort thing, but you would be surprised how important comfort is for participants. Yes. Uh, moving onward, you might want to co-register the data. This is necessary if you want to make population statements in a homogeneous space. Uh, you might want to smooth the data, meaning that you, you might want to integrate things so that you don't get these jagged pixel edges and you can do better smoothing estimates. Uh, or you might want to filter temporal or spatial frequencies from your data. Uh, so temporal frequencies might be that you say, okay, well, I I know that I'm going to get the signal decay over time, so everything which is in the frequency band uh, below something or above something else, I'm going to filter out. You do this via bandpass filtering or via high-pass filtering if you just want to get rid of the low frequencies. Uh, and of course, you can do a lot more, but ev each and every one of these corrections comes at a cost, simply because every correction requires an interpolation. Every correction requires you to, uh, to modify your numbers in a way which does not guarantee that the initial data is completely recoverable. So ideally what you do is you try to do as few as possible of these things, ideally almost none, and you try to ask your experiment and if, if it really doesn't work then you say okay well I'm gonna have to correct for this. Okay, uh, so this is basically what we have to do, and all of this needs to be represented in an orderly fashion. Like, how on earth do we do this? And for that, we have what are known as workflows. So they're basically complex flow charts in which each node represents a process which we apply to the data. And we start at the beginning where we get the scan, and we end at the bottom where we have a data sync. So basically, that's a small script which just puts the, the scan in the correct location on disk. And in between that, we pre process the scan. Uh, and this has uh, numerous steps. If you don't see it on the screen, you can look it up on, uh, on your own documents and zoom in. We can go from top to bottom really quick. It's actually not as complex as it looks simply because multiple of these nodes represent just the registration. So we start with the dummy scans, which means that we remove scans from the beginning, uh, which have uh, hyper intense signal. I'm going to show you that in the next slice. We have a slice timer, which does the slice timing correction, which I've talked to you about. And then we have a temporal mean, which sums everything up so that we have one 3D representation of the data, which we then use for registration. So everything which is below temporal mean, where we take a temporal mean of the functional data, is registration. Like it's, it's a collection of six nodes, and you can see them F bias correct, S bias correct. So it's F for functional and S for structural. Uh, the bias correction simply means that we remove low frequency components, but not from the time course, as I have told you earlier when I was talking about frequency filtering, uh, but rather from the spatial 3D representation of the images. And the reason why we do this is that if you look at the images, so if we try to go back to the structural scan or also the functional scan, if you look at these images, you will know that the signal is more intense. Where? Where is the signal more intense? In the back. Well... No, actually in the front and in the top. If you look, the, the slices at the beginning are more towards the front, but actually the front is not that important. It's the top that's important, yeah? Because at the top, it's closer to the coil, meaning that you get more signal. At the bottom, it's further away from the coil, meaning that you get less signal. If you look at the template, you will see that there is no such difference in the template. So if we want to be able to register our data to the template, we need to make sure that this inhomogeneity is taken care of. Otherwise, we would just fit the cortex in the middle of this thing. So that's why we do this bias correction. Uh, and then we do two different registration steps. We do the F register, which basically registers the functional scan to the structural scan, and the S register, which registers the structural scan to the template. Basically, we have two transformation matrices. One is from functional to structural, and one is from structural to template. Then we merge them. There are two, two linear transformations. They can be merged very simply. And then we apply that composite transformation, which results from this merge utility, to the functional data before it was averaged. 
So basically we have this compound transformation which allows you us to transform this time course data onto the template. And that's basically what, uh, what the preprocessing is. If you want to look at any specific step tomorrow, we can do that, but right now I can show you just two of these steps. Uh, this is the dum these are the dummy scans. What's, what's the interesting thing which you notice on this graph? Yes. It looks sort of linear, but it's actually like jittery, basically. Yes, that's, that's also true. That's very good. Peak yeah, exactly. It's the Nike graph. And uh, the reason why you have this peak at the beginning is because the saturation of the signal is a lot higher at the beginning. We deface our sample every second, but since you do that every second, the spins do not have time to return to the steady state which they have outside of the MR experiment. Which is why at the beginning you will get much more signal because you can deface much more, uh, but you will converge on a steady state where you get a lot less signal. Yeah? The problem is if you take the data like this, this effect would mess up whatever modeling you want to do because it is, as you can see, much, much stronger than any effect you can have to, you can hope to get for in the data because our effect of interest, our feature of interest, is actually hidden somewhere in that jitter. As you can see, this, uh, this initial phase completely uh, outperforms that, which is why we need to correct for dummy scans. We need to remove these scans. This is part of the preprocessing. Uh, this could be done before by the software, so it could have just thrown away the first 10 to 20 scans, or it could not have, which is why we have a function which checks the metadata files for whether it was done already, and if it hasn't been done, then it does it. That's why it makes sense to have the metadata, because otherwise we'd need to, to chop, 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 or we'd need to look at the data and to see, okay, well, is it bigger? But this way we can just have a quick glance at the metadata and in very few seconds just get rid of these first volumes in as far that is, as that is still needed. Very simple manipulation, but the most complex part of the preprocessing in this case is the registration which I'm going to show to you here. Basically, we do it with um, a piece of software, which is called ANTS, the Advanced Normalization Tools, and it contains functions which give you the possibility to apply different uh, transformations to the images. And as I said, this, the, we have two phases in this. We have structural to template and functional to structural. And in the structural to template registration, we basically have different phases. The first one is a rigid phase. And uh, the way which you do this is you would start off simply by aligning the center of gravity of the two of the two volumes that's fairly easy to do the program can do that automatically and then you can start moving them around a rigid transformation means that you just move it as a rigid body this would be the analog of just moving two objects around like two physical objects which you can't deform a fine means that you can deform the object which you're moving but only via its affine so you can do translation which you could do with a rigid transformation as well what else can you do as part of the affine? Rotate. Yes. Scaling. Yes. There's actually one more, well, two more, which I haven't showed you because they're not so relevant. One is shearing. That basically means that you just angle one of the axes. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, mirroring, but that's like a special case of rotation. OK, uh, so that's what you can do with, via the rigid transformation and the affine. And if you're curious about any of these parameters, I can tell you more about them. Uh, basically, the one which stands out is the metric. Uh, which means that the, the program needs to know, okay, am I, am I moving in the right direction? It's an optimization problem, yeah? And for that, it needs an output metric, and it needs to know how well are these pictures overlapping. And that's what you give here. In the first case, it's GC, so global correlation. This is basically a correlation, so like a Pearson's R over all of the voxels in the image, or in this case, a fraction of them, or mutual information. That's basically a comparison of histograms. It's an information ma uh, metric, uh, and it's uh, more robust to difference in contrasts. Additionally, we have the SYN, SYN. This stands for Symmetric Normalization Transformation, which we also use when we transform the structural to the template. And that's because sometimes the brain of the mouse really is different. Like maybe some part of it grew a bit larger. Uh, but it still corresponds to the spatial features of the template. So we want to fit that into the template. Uh, and the way we can do this 
is not via rigid movement, it's not via the affine, because you can't, like, it's a local deformation. You can't do anything local with the affine or with a rigid body transformation. For that, you need nonlinear transformations, which look like warp fields. So if you've ever used Photoshop or, or GIMP or image manipulation, you know there's a tool where you can, like, drag around bits of the image. This is basically what this does, but in 3D. Again, we use mutual information, and at the very end, we also transform the functional scan to the structural scan. Uh, here here we use a simple rigid body transformation, uh, simply because if you would do a nonlinear transformation here, you would end up overfitting the image. So if you think back to the structural and the functional scan, let's go back you will see that here a lot of signal is missing. So there's a lot of gaps which here exist, but here don't exist. The reason why they don't exist is because you couldn't acquire any signal simply because you, the, it got defaced. But what would happen if you tried to transform this thing nonlinearly to this thing, uh, is that all of this volume down here in, in the bottom slices will end up being stretched upwards to fill this part which is available here, meaning that you would invent a lot of data which doesn't exist. So which is why here we do rigid, affine, and nonlinear, and when we transform functional to structural, we just do the rigid. Um, yeah. So you, for both structural to template, so you can choose if it's rigid or nonlinear? Mm -hmm. Okay. You specify this in the first line of the text where it says transform colon. At the beginning it has, says SYN, that stands for symmetric normalization. It's a name for them, their nonlinear transformation. And here it says rigid. If you go to the previous slides, you'll notice that here it says affine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so what you want to do at the end, after you've processed the data to a, in a fashion which is satisfactory for the questions which you want to ask is you want to be able to uh, make some statements about the data. And the way in which you can make statements in science is you need to quantify the uncertainty. So you want to be able to say something, okay, A is so-and-so, uh, uh, with, what, with what probability am I wrong here? Or with what probability would I be able to say this if I were wrong? Uh, and one way to do this is the general linear model. You might be familiar with this formula. What this usually, what this does, it is allows you to explain a set of observed or dependent variables via some theory which you have in your head uh, which is called a set of independent variables. So it basically allows you to explain why given x. And x is a summary of your theory. And this is not an MR explanation, but you can see this everywhere in science. And I'm giving you this so that you understand that this is really not any different in MR. So this is a very simple example of a general linear model. You have six observations which you believe or know come from two categories. This can either be the design of your experiment or, or your hypothesis, and you're trying to fit this model. So basically you give it x, which in this case is this uh, two by six matrix. You give it y, which in this case is this one by six matrix, which you have observed. And what you want to know are, M, are mu one and mu two. This is very simple. This is basically equivalent to a t-test if you then want to compare mu one and mu two, simply because you have an average and a, uh, a distribution of errors, which will be normally distributed. Uh, the way this is fitted is via least squares, so you're basically trying to minimize the, the sum of the squares of the difference between, uh, of the, sorry, not of the difference, of the error terms, which are the difference between your median values and the observed values, yeah? This is equivalent to a t-test, somewhat more intricate, simply because in a t-test you would just take the shortcut and you wouldn't even try to estimate the, um, the averages, you would just look at the differences. But you can do this a lot in a lot more, in a considerably more complex fashion, you can do something you can't do with a t-test, namely try to compare three groups. Of course, with three groups, you can't just do one by one comparisons as with the t-test, because then you would risk making more type one errors because you would be actually fishing for data which happens to be different, which is why here you would do an analysis of variance, so an F factor, which basically looks whether or not the variance between the groups is larger than the variance within the groups. So this is an ANOVA, both the t-test and the ANOVA, which are very broadly used statistical tools in biology, are special cases of using the GLM or using the same mathematical operations which go into the GLM. Goes a bit further. You can try to look at uh, interactions. So you can have what you would call a two-way ANOVA. Here you would compare a sample which is different, which can be grouped into categories, but not just by one criterion, in this case by two criteria. So you could think of the blue categories as people who are, I know, who have uh, brown hair, red 
red hair or, or uh, blonde hair, and you can think of the red categories as male or female. So in this case, you would have one dude with brown hair and one girl with brown hair, and so on. Uh, and then you try to make statements within the same population, okay, is more variance explained by the gender or is more variance explained by the color of the hair? You can even go one step further because maybe something really magical happens if you're a girl and you have red hair, but not to anybody else. For that, you would need interaction terms, which basically looks like this. You not only have the two categories, but you also have a one for each specific type of interaction. Okay, does anybody see anything that's wrong here? Because we have like way more parameter on the... Yeah, in which means that we've over-parameterized our data. Simply because for each interaction term, there's only one sample. So for girls who have red hair, there is only one. So you really can't make estimates. Basically, you would end up explaining all of the variance in your sample via, the, via this matrix, which you don't want. But of course, this isn't what we're like. This isn't necessarily what we're trying to do in fMRI. Uh, we use the same technology, which is used for all of these population studies, but we're applying it to time course data. So the way in which we, we would apply this to, to population data looks something like this. So we would still have the same matrices. Yeah, We would have our observed variables, which in our case would be the time points. Uh, we would have our um, contrast, which are the x values, which is what we know we stimulated in the brain with our fiber. And in addition to that, we will have other columns on, uh, on the, the design matrix. The design matrix is something which you construct to allow you to optimally fit your theory to the data. And the reason why you might have a one is simply because you want to take out everything which is constant over time. This may or may not be useless depending on whether or not you bandpass filtered your data. If you did any bandpass or high pass filtering, obviously you got rid of the constant term. If you didn't, you will need to put the explanations for the frequencies which you want to get rid of in this matrix. Here we just assume that we get rid of the constant term. Uh, so this is basically a GLM example, exactly the same thing which you would do for all sorts of statistics, but specifically for time course data in fMRI. Uh, you can also do multiple regression, meaning that you can have two different types of stimulations which you deliver to the animal. Like you can present red light, or actually you can present stimulation in the brain where we stimulate, and an odor. Yeah, and these could be two completely independent time courses, which you then model as two different rows on your design matrix. Uh, and of course, we need to represent all of this as, uh, as a workflow, simply because this needs to take place in an automated fashion on the computer as well. Uh, and of course, we have a graph for that. This is how the graph looks like for the general linear model. Uh, and the actual magic, so the mathematical fitting, is happening at the second row from the bottom to the top in the middle where it says GLM. That's where the actual model is being fitted. Everything else is, again, just specific preparation of the, for, of the data for this process. Uh, it looks, again, a bit more complicated than it is. Basically, everything on the left-hand left side of the figure, these are just naming operations. So we're just figuring out how to name the files. That is entirely trivial and has absolutely nothing to do with the data. On the right-hand side, we have the steps which have something to do with the data. Uh, in this case, we're dealing with CBV data, which has an inverse contrast. So we have a node where we invert this data. And then we have this bandpass filter, which we've been talking about. Uh, we have another so to say stream through the workflow where we specify the model, where we say, okay, based on the event file, you remember the event file, which I told you about. This isn't just useful because you can figure out what I did with the animal. It's also useful because the computer can automatically calculate the design matrix based on it. You see the event file, a file is one of the nodes at the top, and based on that, the model is automatically specified, and it is then formulated as a level one design and as a design matrix, which is done by the level one design and model gen nodes. That's computational hocus pocus, which uh, doesn't necessarily impact the, the work which we're doing, but which needs to be ke kept track of if you want to automatize this, yeah? Um, can you please go back? Yes. So here, what we see, like the y-axis is like the contrast? No, so the, the first matrix, which is on the right-hand side of the equal sign, is what is known as the dependent variable. It's what we measure. What we look at. So this is the time course. Each voxel has a time course. So basically, in each voxel, you do this. Okay. 100,000 times, which makes you realize why it's very important to have all of this properly automatized, because there is no way to do all of this <laughs> manually. And the X and, y, uh, X and uh, W is the... 
uh, like we have different var uh, different simulation. No, so this yes. Is the first simulation, the W is the second simulation? Yes, exactly. So those are regressors. Yeah, they're basically contrast mm -hmm. theories which you have about what could be happening in the data which you, for which you want to extract variance. It could be two different stimuli which you gave, or it could be two different aspects of the same stimulus, which is something you'll see in a second. Yeah, but it, all in all, it's two different things which you want to extract out of the data. But basically, we only have like one. Um, value that is given to us, right? Like the contrast. The so the values which we get, you get at the end, are the beta values. Exactly. Yeah. So in this case, you would get three. Exactly, but I mean, from from the scans, we get the um, the comp like the the pixel intensities, so to say, right? That's like that's only one. Yeah, so for each spatial point, you have one value at each time point. Uh, here we model the time course simply because we apply stimulation as a function of time, and we're curious at how that is represented in space, which is why here in each matrix you basically have the time course of each single voxel. Also detail this a bit more in the future. Lo looking at the d workflow, this is what it looks like, and it converges to this GLM. Let's look at different parts of this workflow. Uh, so for instance, the entire technique which we use here is called SPM, Statistical Parametric Mapping. Uh, and this is the name for both a statistic approach developed by Carl Friston or a software package which used to be the reference implementation of this approach. In the meantime, there are very many software packages doing this. And basically what this SPM consists of is voxel-wise time series analysis. This is basically what I've uh, mentioned to you uh, a couple of seconds ago, namely that you do this GLM this model fitting for the time course of each and every voxel, voxel-wise, time series analysis. Fairly simple. Uh, it's also generally mass univariate, meaning that you you do all of this, but you generally have one variable for each. Uh, like your uh, your uh, dependent vari uh, your dependent variable uh, basically has a width of one. Yeah. It's a mass univariate approach, and it ad addresses specific time series issues such as autocorrelation. So you can't, if you would be fitting general linear models in statistics or in psychology, and you would be doing what I told you about, oh, look at, let's look at red-haired people and women and men or whatever, uh, you would basically uh, not deal with time courses. Yeah, You would simply deal with categories which you can make arbitrarily and which can be biased, but that's completely beside the point. However, if you're doing a time series analysis, this imposes a bias. Yeah, If we go back to the... Um, to these things here, yeah? The fact that you're the first uh, woman who was measured, no, like the first red-haired person who was measured in this uh, test doesn't make any statement regarding the similarity of your score with the next red-haired person measured in this test, at least in, not in as far as you're the first or you're the second. But if you look at this approach where you try to fit, uh, fit this model to a time series data, the fact that this is happening now uh, is very strongly related to how it was a second ago and how it will be a second in the future. Yeah? So there's a very high spatial autocorrelation, meaning that you will get vastly uh, um, how do you call them, vastly uh, optimistic estimates simply because your data tends to be coherent from one time point to the next. Yeah. So if you figure out what, so to say, the width is of this temporal autocorrelation, uh, then you will be at a sweet spot where if you have contrast of that width, a lot of significant stuff will magically appear. Uh, but ideally, you have a software package which takes care of this, and most of the software packages which do fMRI analysis do this properly. Like they estimate autocorrelation and they correct for it. And now let's look at the actual data. We've looked at matrices. I understand you don't like matrices because they're mass and they're boring. So let's make them colorful. This is the exact same thing which I've showed you before, but it's like for kindergartners because it has color. On the right-hand side, you see your uh, dependent variable, so your output in red. This is a time course per voxel over time. You would normally see the same thing, but tilted by 90 degrees. Uh, and this is explained by a beta zero, so, so let's say your ground state, and this contrast. Yeah, you can see the cyan lines. This is one we stimulate, times a beta one, what you want to estimate, and an error matrix. Of course, just fitting this model to that time course won't work out very well, simply because the, the brain doesn't respond immediately to this optical stimulation, especially not since we are not even measuring the actual electrical activity, which also takes some time to get going, but the hemodynamic activity which results from it. 
uh, that means that we need to convolve this signal with the response function. So basically, there is such a thing as an impulse response function. If I show you a visual stimulus now, how long does it take until your uh, um, occipital cortex, like your visual cortex, gets activated? Uh, and that is generally either a beta function or a series of gamma functions. And we model that simply by convolving this matrix, which is basically 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, with that wave shape. And what we would get is something like this. Basically, now we still have a design matrix which we're trying to fit. This is nothing biological. This is entirely constructed based on our knowledge of the system. And now we have a time course. It's no longer binary. And this is something which you can already see. It fits quite well with the data. Like there's some some turfs where it goes down, and this like they align pretty well with uh, with how this thing goes down. So that's uh, already that's already looking quite good. Uh, but what we, you will see based on the data, which is not the rationale uh, based on which you should make such decisions, but what you would know also based on previous experiments is that optogenetic stimulation tires the cells out. Uh, so basically, at the beginning, you will stimulate a lot stronger than at the end. So ideally, you would add a second regressor to explain away this additional var variation, which is not normal. And that's exactly what you can do by adding a second regressor, which explains this temporal decay, and is, of course, orthogonalized relative to the, to the first one. You looked like you wanted to ask something. Yes, so the convolution is just, um, it maps from um, the, like, so we give, um, uh, a risk, not a response. Um, we give a stimulus and mm -hmm. it maps to the expectation how this stimulus will actually, what response this stimulus will evoke. Yeah, so what, what we do is we have a theory based on prior observation of how the brain responds to stimulation. Yeah, uh, we, just, we have an impulse response function, namely a standardized, okay, if I give one single pulse of this duration and I do it enough times, I can estimate, like if I sum that thing a lot and a lot and a lot of times, ideally it would look something like my design matrix. And I've done that before and we know what this impulse response function is. So basically each time, for each time point, we multiply apply the time point via the response function and we add it up on top of each other. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that's what the convolution means. And, and so, for example, if, if we had just a lot of stimuli repeated, like, very re repeated shortly after each other, mm -hmm. then you ha just would have a straight line? Or? Yes, exactly. Uh, that's why it's also important to optimize your contrast, simply because if you don't stimulate at all, it's not, you're not going to be able to measure the stimulation effect. Uh, but also, if you stimulate all the time, you will not be able to measure the stimulation effect. If you just stimulate once, it will be difficult. If you stimulate all the time except once, it will also be difficult. So ideally, you space them in between each other so that you get an optimal contrast estimation. This can be solved numerically. Like This, this is a mathematical problem, which has nothing to do with biology and you can optimize this, and in fact, we have. So this is what it would look like in the end with two regressors, sorry, which, would, which will explain the, um, the actual effects of the stimulation and the temporal decay of the stimulation. Uh, the reason why, uh, yeah, do you, do you notice anything weird here, which you might not expect? Yeah. It doesn't just decay, it also flips. Yeah. Here, yeah. yes. Uh, that is simply because you have a suspicion why that might be? Nope. That's simply on? because you want to orthogonalize each design specification with respect to the others. You want this second design matrix to explain as few features as possible in addition to the first one. If it would not do this inverted thing, and if it would just go from a maximum to a zero, it would be a linear combination of something like this and something like the second regress like the first regressor. So the idea is that you should not be able to explain the second regressor, regressor as a linear combination of the first regressor or, and anything else. Because the first and in this case, you can't, simply because if you take the first regressor out of the second one, you will just shift it more to the bottom. If you add it to the second one, you will just raise it more to the top. This is basically the second regressor with as little of the first one in it as possible. And the zero with regressor is kind of just a straight line. The zeroth regressor would be a straight line, yes. Mm -hmm. Any anything else that looks weird? No? 
It, you don't see that it looks a bit like, this one looks a bit like an S if you look at the baseline shape, and the other one looks a bit like a D. Like they're deformed. It's like not a straight line with features coming out of it. Any idea what that might be? But simply because we have band passed filtered our data, so we've taken out all of the low frequency components. Consequently, if we want to fit a model to it, we should also band pass filter the model. And this is basically what this looks like if you take the low frequency components out of it. Simply because a, a flat line is a infinitely, uh, well, it, it basically has a, a, a period of infinity, right? It's a very low frequency component. Okay, let's look at how this looks like when we actually obtain a result. So what we're actually looking for are the B, uh, B1 and B2 estimates for each voxel. And once we have these B1 and B2 estimates, we can formulate uh, a statistical measure of how significant they are. We can represent them in the light of the variance which we observe. And we can of course do that, So, and after we do that, basically we condense our 4D data to 3D with a value at each voxel representing how well it corresponds to this design. And the way this would look like is something like this. Uh, when in the background you see the template, which we've already gone over. The crosshairs are now not at the origin anymore. They are at the specific coordinates where we have stimulated. And if you look on the right hand, on, on the left, left hand side, you will see the color map. And you see that in the middle, we don't plot the values because we just want to look at the more significant values. We have, the, uh, we have a threshold of t plus minus three. So we see everything which has a t value of above three or a t value of below minus three. And this is what we see. Would you care to describe the stimulation pattern? Okay, so well, the main feature with which you can see in the stimulation pattern is that you have uh, stimulation, so positive responses, yeah, around the point where you stimulate, mainly in the brainstem, and you have very strong negative responses, mainly in the cortex. Uh, but of course, you don't see the entire picture because we're still dealing with data which is too highly dimensional to properly visualize. This data is still 3D, and we're still at a point where each voxel has a value. They're not really transparent, so you can't look at everything at once. The, what we could do is we could try navigating through the brain. For instance, if we navigate here, we see that there's really big clusters of inactivation on the cortex. Basically, how we would summarize this, if we stimulate a nucleus in the brainstem and we see activity there and deactivation in the cortex, what would you conclude? That the brainstem in it de inhibits, uh, inhibits the cortex. Exactly, that is, that is what you would conclude. In fact, we stimulate the serotonergic system, so the dorsal raphe, which contain the cell bodies of the serotonergic system in the brain, we stimulate those, and those project throughout the brain, so we would definitely expect activity all over the place, or reactions all over the place. And it turns out that, of course, it is inhibitory, and we also know that from molecular biology, because we know that the vast majority of, uh, of receptors for serotonin are metabotropic and uh, also inhibitory. There's one last thing we're going to go through, and that is significance thresholding. So if you look here, you're going to see that there's a lot of noise, so singled out voxels. Uh, do we want to get rid of them? Yes or no? Again, depends on the question which we're asking. A lot of people who do human fMRI and they just want to find out which reason is responsible for love or, or bullshit like that, uh, will want to get rid of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to do something like that, you will want to get rid of all the noise because the no noise will show how, uh, how bad your statement that just one region is responsible for anything is. Uh, in that case, you will want to do that. Whether it's correct is another question. But in our case, we certainly don't want to do that because we know that the system is projecting all over the brain. We don't want to delete anything uh, just on account of it being small. However, we might want to raise our significance threshold. That is simply because here I've told you we are running this GLM for hundreds of thousands of voxels. We, we don't have a p-value, we have t-statistics, but we could transform them in p-values. And the very common threshold is a p-value of 0 0.05, uh, which means, what does, what does a p-value mean? Probability of H1 being, uh, what, false, giving H0 is true or something? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probability of uh, saying that h uh, one is correct when h zero is correct. It's it's al- almost almost correct. The, 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 the a p value of zero point five means that the probability of h zero being two, given data at least as extreme as this, is five percent. Great. Now what happens if you do this a hundred times and there's no effect? You have you basically have a comparison for which there is no effect, but you perform the comparison a hundred times. You will find an effect. When you do it yes, you will find an effect in how many of the cases? Yes, exactly. If you if you have a p threshold of 0 0.05, it will be somewhere around five. This is exactly what happens. Now, if you consider that we're looking at 100,000, you might expect there to be 5,000. That's a lot of voxels, which would look significant, but you don't want that, them to be significant. There's two things you can do about that. First one is called the family-wise error rate. An example for that is the simple Bonferroni correction. It's one of the more most aggressive corrections if you're into aggressive stuff. And basically what it says is um, we're going to decide on a threshold, on a p-threshold, so that not a single value of this family will unrightfully meet this threshold. So in this case, it's quite simple. You have a p-value of 0.05. You do 100 measurements. What you do to arrive at your new threshold corresponding to 0.05 on one measurement, but for the entire family, is you, de- uh, is you divide 0.05 by 100, and you get to this number. Uh, the problem is, of course, it's very aggressive, and not everybody is into aggressive stuff as much as you are. Uh, simply because, yes, exactly, simply because this aggressive correction is very good at protecting you against type 1 errors. You will not end up making any statements which are false. However, you will pay for this by making a lot of type 2 errors, meaning that there will be a lot of stuff which is actually happening, but it's, uh, you're going to end up discounting it simply because you have higher standards of significance. You, you can never balance the, the two out perfectly, uh, but you can try to do this better with a false discovery rate. False discovery rate is particularly suitable for fMRI, and even more so if you're doing one of those human studies where you're trying to find broad regions, quote unquote, responsible for broad phenomena. And that is you say, okay, well, I'm doing this comparison, and I can live with the fact that I'm going to be, I'm going to state that things are true sometimes when they're not, but I would like to limit the extent to which I do that. So instead of saying that I'm going to do that in 0% of the cases. You can say, OK, I'm going to set a false discovery rate of uh, 5%, meaning that I am going to observe, I am going to make type 1 error rates all over the place, but there will be only 5%, uh, which is actually quite good if you have a representation like this. Well, I, actually, it might be problematic in a representation like this. But if you only think of the big clusters, if we would have done like a, a threshold filtering for the extent, then basically whether the cluster has 4% more or 5% more on this side or the other side doesn't really change the statement. So these are the two ways in which you can get around the multiple comparison problem in fMRI. Uh, having said that, we're done, and um, we're going to have to talk a bit about tomorrow. So do you know where you're going to